Just the three announcements from uh, Sunday, just to recap those. Uh, church picnic is uh, coming up on November 4th. That's the week after this coming week. Uh, Robbie is on vacation. Uh, I got a report from him today that he's feeling very well. He had a real good night's sleep and good rest. And then I think the medicinal purposes uh, for uh, medicinal properties of uh, Dungeness crab and oysters have have cured him because he had, had a real good dinner last night, he said. Uh, and then well, lastly, uh, early voting is going on right now uh, until I think it's uh, November 3rd, so don't forget to go vote. All right, as is our custom, let's take a few moments to uh, examine ourselves and make sure we're all geared, ready to listen to the uh, teaching of the word, and I'll begin with a prayer, and then we'll open it up. Heavenly Father, we thank you for once again, we have the privilege to assemble here as a local church to hear the teaching of your word. And we thank you, Father, for uh, Dr. House coming here to uh, uh, teach us tonight, and we pray that you will help us to concentrate, and I will pray that you will give him clarity as he brings the word of God to us now, and we pray these things in Christ's name, amen. Okay, Dr. House. It's good to be with you again. Uh, we're going to do tonight, and Thursday night is going to be a continuation of tonight, unless you want to go for three hours. <laughs> and uh, then Sunday, we will do something probably a little different, too. So I'm, I'm working on some stuff. Um, I've been working on the question of archaeology, and I got such a good response from that. I've continued it because if people are benefiting, and I enjoy doing it, so why not? Uh, if you get tired of it, let me know. <laughs> But um, I thought what I might do different tonight is not only talk about archaeological sites and issues, but also connect that to the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So it's really going to be an exposition somewhat of what you see in Acts 2 and tie in aspects that are important from an archaeological standpoint. I would encourage you also to consider the House Visual Study Bible again if you haven't signed up for it because I'm including a lot of things that uh, you will find in the, some of the talks I do right now. In other words, I'm, uh, you'll find the development in that. If you haven't looked at it, it's, it's, it's fairly thorough uh, in what I get, you know, in the chapters I'm uh, finished dealing with aspects of the Bible. Uh, there's also a contemporary issue right now that I'm not going to go into in any depth that is actually uh, confronting the church. Uh, I was asked to come to, at a university in Southern California to speak on this, and I did a lot of research on it, and I thought, wow. And so I did that speaking, and then I was asked, I spoke on it again at a conference I did about three weeks ago, uh, 16 hours that week teaching this, these things. And I'm now producing probably it'll be two books out of it with uh, various people who are scholars in a number of different areas dealing with the question of the historicity of the biblical text in contrast to the very propagated uh, theory of uh, you know, what is called theistic evolution, in which people are saying that the biblical text is mythical in these places of history. It's not true history because uh, we know by science these facts. And so it's a reversal to several incidents like this that have occurred historic, historically in the church, and particularly about a hundred years ago with a man by the name of Rudolf Bultmann. And so we have evangelicals going into Christian seminaries and colleges teaching now who are pushing this viewpoint and making quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of progress. And I, I won't go into it any more than that, but it's a very important subject to understand um, the question of historicity. So I'm dealing with that somewhat in the study Bible now and also these two books that are coming out. So uh, that's enough of that. Now onto this course. Uh, what we have is archaeology in the day of Pentecost. And what we're going to do is uh, I'll try this different ways to make it work. Uh, we're going to look at the biblical text, but we're going to integrate. And so I've given it for you here. You can read it. Uh, now when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all with in one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a 
from the sky a sound like the rushing of a mighty wind. It filled all the house. And notice I put the word temple building because it's not really necessarily referring to a habitation. The terminology, if you check the Greek word, will allow different things, particularly in reference to the temple. And so uh, where they were sitting, tongues like fire appeared and were distributed to them, and one sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak. And so this is the initial statement that we're looking at. And as you well know, probably this is the southwestern corner. This is where they have that place at the top that says the place of the trumpeting, where they would call people to order at the time. And this is part of the uh, walls of the temple, although other than the lower portions of the wall, uh, they have been built up over the time by the Crusaders and even by the Muslims. Uh, so all the walls of Jerusalem are not the same because of the time period. And uh, obviously when the Romans knocked a bunch of the walls down, that sort of made somebody have to put them up. So uh, some of these things you just have to understand. But here's a, a look at how the temple setup probably looked. Uh, if you look at this area right here, uh, if you can see this, this is called Robinson's Arch. And a uh, very... I'll tell you what. I don't like computers sometimes. Okay, Robinson's Arch, and okay, I'm going to try this other. This may be too much trouble. I don't want to do that. Maybe it won't do it if I do this. Okay, here's the temple building per se, but all of this. <laughs> okay, <laughs> who's doing this? Is there somebody at the back? <laughs> I'm just going to push this thing. Maybe that'll work. Uh, okay. You have at the back there uh, the temple, and you can see that it actually has on either side of it is a lot of room. And some of you have been with me to Israel. I know, look at some people. I see several of you have been with me. When you get on the top of the Temple Mount, what was around the Temple Mount was this barrier which you could walk through. They had places to walk through. But there were warnings about if you are not a Jew you're not allowed to come in on pain of death. And they have discovered two of these, both of which I have in the study Bible. But uh, what you find is that uh, at the, you also had a place that only referred to men and not women. Women could not come into the inner area, and you can talk to them about that. But the, the fact is that's the way it was done. Um, now, if you look at Robinson Arch, it goes up into a grouping of buildings, okay? And so uh, I'll show you more about that in just a second, but I think this is probably the location at which the disciples were sitting. Now, in Jewish thought, you sat to learn and you stood to pray. So the fact that they were sitting means that somebody was teaching and the rest were listening. And probably we're looking at Peter, because he's the one that took over when the people actually came. So I think that's probably a, a good perspective on that. This is the what is called the Alaska Mosque. This is where Solomon's portico once stood. This was added many years later, obviously. But at one time, uh, the Romans, what they did when they came into the Temple Mount, is they destroyed all the buildings on top of the temple. They did not destroy all the walls. They tore off some of the upper walls, but the rest they didn't try to destroy the whole temple, temple mount. And remember when you look at Matthew 24, when the disciples came back over the, there was a bridge over the, the Kidron Valley at that point, and they came across it and they were talking to one another about what the fantastic buildings these were, if you remember the story. Now, if you look at the Temple Mount with its buildings and also the temple itself, there probably was no rival in the world among the temples to the Greeks that were as fantastic buildings as was this building. In other words, what Herod put together in the second temple after, you know, after he worked it, he produced a work that was phenomenal in the ancient world. Some of you have been to the Acropolis maybe. You know, you've been to some of the other temples in the ancient world. There's nothing like what they had in Jerusalem. A phenomenal area, plus it had this other section I'm going to show you here in a second, where you have 
what is probably like this. Now, the reason why I do that, I'm afraid to even touch this thing to go show you. I wish I could point it. But the red top thing, if you look at that building, is very close to what you see in Athens. If you go to Athens and look down from Mars Hill, or what is called the Areopagus, or you look down from the Acropolis, where the temple of, Af of, uh, of uh, uh, wisdom is, the person of wisdom, uh, you, you can look down and you can see this big building. That was called the Stoa, and that's the place where the Stoics were. And these are the people that were predominant at this period of time in Athens. You had two major philosophical schools, those of the Stoics and those of the Epicureans. And Paul had an argument with them, or, or not a, a, a railing. He had an uh, uh, intellectual discussion with them regarding nature and God. And uh, so that would have been a building very similar. You would see it in today's Athens if you were to go there. So a very similar kind of building that they had. Now again, the Temple Mount, the disciples said, man, these buildings are wonderful, and they were. But Jesus said, and not one stone shall stand upon another in what you're talking about. And that actually happened. All the buildings on top of the Temple Mount were destroyed. But not everything else was destroyed around it. And so what actually Jesus said very specifically is true. Now if you look at Acts chapter 2 verses 5 through 13 as we look through this then, we find out that there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews who were devout men from every nation under the sky. Now I make a point later on, but I'll mention it here and you'll see it later, that dwelling here does not mean that they had homes there that they lived in. In other words, they were not inhabitants of Jerusalem per se. The word dwell here, this Greek term, actually can refer to any number of things, but particularly uh, when uh, these dwellings refer to residing somewhere like in a motel for two or three days. You know, it's not talking about this was your homestead or something that you lived in and your family. Why do I say that? Partly it's because this is a time of Pentecost, the time in which people came back to Jerusalem from throughout the world for the feasts. Very common. See, Jews were pretty consistent on following the, the, uh, the calendar of the feast. And so there in the city, many, many of them, thousands of them visiting, not for weeks, but for the, the uh, feast of, uh, of, uh, that was, we call Pentecost. Okay? So there was a dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews devout from every nation under the sky. When this sound was heard, what sound? There was a sound that the Holy Spirit made. Now, if you've ever heard a loud sound, it usually gets your attention. Even if you have a really rustling wind, it gets your attention. And so the point of it is, this is an intention getter. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. I'm just sort of moving through this. So the crowd was bewildered because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. So you have two things. The sound got their attention and brought them somewhere there. And then they encountered this issue of the tongues of fire as at one point and speaking in a long own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, aren't these all speaking Gal Galileans? Now, the reason why we say the Galileans because the Galileans had a distinct dialect. In other words, it's sort of like, uh, you know, living in somebody around Boston or someplace or somewhere they have a distinct dialect that says, we know you're not from our, ha you know, our town. You're not from this state or whatever. You have a dialect that, that identify you. And the Galileans had one. They did not sound like the average Jew. Okay. Now, we don't have any indication what it sounded like. We don't have any recordings, see. <laughs> but we know it was different, and it got attention. They were am amazed and marveled, saying, aren't these all Galileans? How do we hear everyone in our own language. And then are mentioned these people, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and people from Mesopotamia, Judea, some in Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya uh, uh, around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans 
and Arabians. That's a good number of people. Now you remember that the Jews had been involved in a diaspora. They had traveled, become part of the world. There was a time when the Jews resided just in Israel. And then they had two deportations, one with the Assyrians and one with the Babylonians. Okay, When the Persians came in, they actually came back. But even then they didn't come back in total. Many of the people stayed in the area of Babylonia. Right? So, uh, for example, uh, Esther didn't leave and come back. And Daniel apparently didn't. There were many people that stayed there in that area. So when you have this idea of people different places, remember the Assyrians when they came in in 722, their practice was when they came into an area, they would take people from that area, large portions of them, and they would distribute them as groups throughout the Syrian Empire. Now there's a reason for that, because it broke down resistance. It broke down a certain sense of belonging. Uh, they weren't fighting for being in Israel anymore. They, they, they made people move throughout the world, the Assyrians did. The Babylonians didn't follow that practice. They actually just came in. The first There were three deportations to, to, uh, to Babylon. And the first one in 610 is when they came in and got Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and people like that because they picked skilled people that could benefit the Babylonian kingdom. They would offer special skills to the kingdom. And by the way, they went and got, came a second time. And when they came the third time, it was just based on the fact that uh, they were angry that the, the king had decided not to pay the tribute. And they came down. And that was the destruction of the city when they did that. But uh, basically the first two were moving people up to benefit the city. So that's what you have with the deportations. So you have people scattered throughout the world for these two reasons that I just mentioned. Now, we're not going to look at all of these groups. Uh, I'll be honest with you, just right up front, I haven't been to all of these countries. So I have not taken pictures in all of these countries. But I have been to a bunch of them. So we'll do the ones that I know about and the ones that I've been to. But uh, the fact is, tonight we're going to cover some specific ones and talk about them as we sort of move in through this intermixture of discussing Acts 2 and the various countries. And I'll talk to you and give you a lot of background information about these places that you may not be familiar with. But notice that what we have here is we have an, uh, the, the definition of the group from all these places. Two things. One, he says Jews. That's obvious. But the other says proselytes, which means that you had a number of people in the ancient world who became what they sometimes called proselytes of the gate. That would be like Cornelius. Uh, he didn't really become a Jew, but he became very interested in the Jewish religion and gave alms and so forth and so on. He, he did not necessarily convert to Judaism, and that was very true of a lot of Roman soldiers. Uh, but they were impressed with certain things about Judaism. They liked the monotheism over against the, the rampant deities running around in Greece, <laughs> supposedly. That began in the first century, you'll find, and this is why some things happened in Alexandria, you find that the Greek myths that had been taught for so many years came into disrepute. And people began to think, that's stupid. And so what happened is that the Greeks moved into allegory in which they took the text and things about in the Greek world and they made them allegorical in their understanding. So they really no longer believed in really the gods. They believed more like Socrates in a deity. You actually had some monotheism coming in, even with that statement that Paul encountered called the unknown God. Uh, it began to move away from the way they thought for many centuries with Hercules and so forth. And that affected, by the way, the Jewish world because at Alexandria, Philo, who was a classicist in his thinking and probably the, the major academic, the major scholar in the Jewish world at that time, particularly in the Greek-speaking world, uh, in Alexandria, of the population of 600,000 people, 200,000 of them were Jews. That's a sizable number in a city. A lot of influence. And, of course, Philo had a lot of influence on people. Later on, uh, some of the things about uh, development of allegory and finally into the church with people like Origen, who was also at Alexandria, as was his teacher, Clement of Alexandria. 
And so you have these events occurring that's changing the way the world is thinking. And that brought a lot of problems to the church later on, but we'll not go into all of that now. So um, I'm just trying to give you a perspective on what we're looking at. And so uh, we will uh, be dealing with those issues that we see ultimately working out in Acts 2 and following. Because remember the proselyte that the evangelist Philip encountered on the road who says, I need someone to teach me, and he was reading the Isaiah. Is he speaking of himself or another? And then Philip preached the gospel and then baptized him in the desert. Remember that story in the book of Acts? Well, see, that's the kind of thing. He was a proselyte, and, and uh, Carnelius was a proselyte. These weren't Jews as such. So um, we have them saying, we hear them speaking in our languages the mighty works of God. Now, that's pretty evident because uh, what is going on here is that they are not preaching the gospel per se. They're not speaking in tongues preaching the gospel. The gospel is preached by Peter. And apparently he spoke it in such a way that all of them could understand it. So that's an interesting issue itself. He was not speaking multiple you know, languages and tongues. He spoke in a language everyone can understand. So it could be, I don't know, maybe that Peter spoke Greek because everybody basically spoke Greek. And so but whatever he did, it was understood by all. And so he was dealing with the fact that what is going on here? Why is this happening? And he tries to answer it to the people, uh, to these people that are listening. Now, something that is subtle subtle in the text of Scripture that you wouldn't necessarily know unless you probably check Greek. Um, I hate to say that sometimes because you feel you look like, well, you know, you, you think you're over everybody else because you can read the Greek language because I'm sorry, it's just the way it works. Uh, the fact is there are things in Greek sometimes that are not as obvious in translation. And that's why you have teachers, I think, to help in those areas. I had a guy this morning, the Bible study was sort of funny because we were discussing Genesis chapter 1 and 1 and 2 and he was trying to argue that when God created the world, he created the world out of something that was there to create from. And I said, no, he created nothing from nothing. God is alone. He doesn't have this. And I explained the concept of what is known as tohu vavohu, which means formless and void. And I explained that formless in that text in Hebrew uh, that word means something that is a structure. And the f void refers to something that is, is something that needs to be filled with. So what you do is you create a structure, like build a house, and you put something in the house, like people or furniture or so forth. You have a form, and you also have a fill. And that's what the text is discussing in the Hebrew. He said, well, you did, you know, you'd have to read that in the Hebrew language to understand this correctly. I said, yeah, I know, that's what I do. This guy couldn't read any Hebrew. But it's amazing how people do this thing. I, and I'm, it's not showing off. But let me, let me put it here. I want you to understand that there's a subtlety that me, we miss. And it, it helps us to understand this passage on the difference between the various ones that are saying, this sounds like these people are mad, they're crazy. And those people say, wow, this is amazing. I can understand it in my language. You have two different responses to what's going on in speaking in tongues. And what's, what you find here is that the writer begins to work on the idea that you have those that are from these various nations, both Jews and proselytes, who came to the feast, right? That's called Pentecost, the 50 days. And that they can understand them in their particular languages. That's not saying that everybody understood everybody else's language. <laughs> is that you have a group of languages that are being understood on the part of the apostles who are speaking some of those languages. But other people said these people are drunk. Well, what you see in the text is this Greek word I put down here. The word is heteroi. You have alas and heteros. And this word right here in the Greek, uh, heteros, when you use it, you're saying you have a certain kind and then you have a different kind. They're not the same kind of group. 
You have one group that's understood one way, another group that's understood another way, another of a different kind. So what you have here is you have a bunch of people that are understanding the language, and that's what you see all the way through verse 12. But they are different from the other ones who don't understand the language, who are of a different kind. So I think what you have here is a discussion where you have the people from all throughout the world could understand these various languages, but the Jews who lived in Judea did not understand these languages and think the apostles are speaking gibberish. Do you understand what I'm saying? And the text really says that if you look in the Greek with it, it recognizes we're dealing with two groups here in the discussion. The people think you're crazy, and the reason why, because nobody can understand the languages, they understand the Hebrew, and the other group who spoke various languages. So that's what's going on in the text, I think. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and spoke out to them, You men of Judea, and those are the people that are the people who live. They have jobs and work in Judea. Probably most of them are probably Jerusalem. On the other hand, and he has a distinction, notice, you men of Judea, all of you and all of you who dwell at Jerusalem. Remember the word dwell, if you go check your Greek dictionary, it doesn't refer to someone who has built a habitation, but someone who is residing, at, doesn't it define how long, but residing at a place for a while. So when they come to the feast, the feast lasts at least a week, so they come and stay there somewhere. They're dwelling, that doesn't mean they're living there, or they don't have property there, okay? So you actually have two clear groups of people that are being developed in the text, and you can see the subtleties in the text to explain that. Does that make all sense to you so far? I hope I am. So these are in the text, you just have to very carefully read them. Now, moving on, but Peter standing up with the 11. Now, why would he be standing up with the 11? You now have a new apostle on the, on the beach. Remember, uh, Judas, uh, he fell away <laughs> and hung himself. And, and so you brought in a man whose name was Matthias. And so they remember they did the little uh, shaking of the, of the dice or whatever you would call them to find out God's will. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried that or not. But, uh, and I'm, I don't know what we should say about that. Uh, but the fact is, God in those days, by the casting of the lots, could actually define the will of God. Now, if God is, and I, I mean, I'm dealing with apostles here. I don't think they're idiots, and I don't think they're superstitious. It was a practice by which God's will could be known. And there may be an alternative. We, I mean, I'm sure we do the same thing. God. You know, if I, if I have a check come in the mail, I, I know you want me to give a certain amount of money to such as. And while the check didn't come, obviously God doesn't want me to. You can define what God is to do so that you can know which way it's going to go. <laughs> is that right? Throwing lots couldn't do that because you put a name of each person, you reckon it down, you throw them down, and whichever comes out. Uh, you, can't, you can't control it as much. But we could do something like that. It says, they lifted up his voice and spoke out to them, you men of Judea and the rest of you who are from the various countries that we've listed. That's what we're saying here. Let this be known to you and listen to my words for these 11 people I'm with aren't drunk as you suppose, seeing it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Now, I don't think that would actually uh, be a, a good proof for a lot of people. I'm sure it's 8, 9, any time in the morning as long as you drink. Uh, you could have drunk people at 9. So, but maybe in the, day, in the land of Judea, it would be unusual to see somebody running around intoxicated at 9 o'clock in the morning. Okay, so at least that's, that's Peter's argument. You, you guys can deal with that. Now, what goes on now is a very ticklish passage of Scripture. He says, Peter said to them, who? The whole group. He said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for, and I'll talk, get back to the word for later for you, the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, we don't have anything in the text that tells us per se uh, that if they do this way, that, you know, this procedure, that they're going to receive the Holy Spirit, although we do have indication uh, in Peter's sermon from Joel that, in fact, God would pour out His Spirit. So he seems to be based, I'm thinking, I can't say this dogmatically, but based on the sermon I read, it seems that Peter has sort of taken this passage in and understands that what we are in is the last days, Messiah has come, and Joel's prophecy in regards to the coming of the Spirit will occur. And that's sort of how he, he, can, he brought his conclusion. Can you understand me on that? He seems to be making his arguments, not he's, he's making them on understanding the book of Joel because he's going to talk about it in a moment. Okay? So he says, um, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God will call to Himself. With many other words He testified and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Then those who gladly received His word were baptized. And I'm going to show you something about baptistry in just a moment. Baptized. Uh, and about 3,000 people were added that day. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. So there's a couple things I want to talk about in explaining this passage. One thing is a question of what is the value of repentance and baptism? And the second thing is that um, were they able to actually baptize 3,000 people? Because scholars for many years said it's not reasonable to believe that 3,000 people could be baptized in one day because there was no access to that kind of bapt baptistic work occurring. In other words, you don't have enough water. By the way, we found out recently there's more water in Israel than we thought. Do you, you, you read about that? They've, uh, 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 they've discovered some caverns that have water. Anyway, the water and also the process of taking care of 3,000 people. Has anybody ever watched an illustration of how people used to baptize as Jews in the ancient world? I don't know if you've seen this. Let me explain it. There's no baptistry, so I have to explain it verbally. Now, rather than the way we do it, where we have people line up, have maybe something on, they come one at a time, the pastor gets up there, he says a few words, takes the person, dunks them under, hopefully he doesn't lose them, and then uh, they would come back up, and it's a long process to get, you know, eight or ten people. That is not how they baptize in the ancient Jewish world. And they had what were called mikvaot. That's a plural form of mikvah. And these were pools, and I'm going to show them to you, that first of all, they said, well, they couldn't do it because they had no ability to have that kind of water and that kind of access a process to, to do it. Well, then they found an evidence of that, and we'll say something about that in a moment. But I want to hold off on that question now and go to the former question, and that is, what value is it to be baptized in reference to salvation? Now, there are some different schools of thought on this, as you well know, uh, some that are Protestant, some that are Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, you have various viewpoints in the church historically on this question. So I don't want to be ridicule. I don't want to ridicule someone because they, it is not necessarily an easy question here. Uh, I don't think it's just a slam dunk in, this, in the discussion when you look at it. And I've given you, I think, three different ways it might be understood, even though I think the latter of the three is probably the best. But what you have to do is when you look at the text... You say, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you'll notice that repentance and baptism are connected. It doesn't say repent, and I realize the Greek doesn't have commas, but it doesn't say repent and then afterwards be baptized. It sort of puts them together. And so what is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind. It is not getting down and crying and screaming and yelling and saying, I'm really, 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 really sorry this time, God. It's not doing that. It's simply 
having a new way of thinking. And that's what Peter is trying to call them to, is to think differently about the Messiah, who he is, what he's done. He's trying to get them to alter their way of actions and doing and thinking. Does that make sense to you? So that's what you basically have with the idea. And obviously to become a follower of Yeshua, you had to change the way you thought if before then you didn't follow. <laughs> so you have to alter your way of thinking. That's the first thing. Second of all, baptism was viewed in the Jewish world as a riot, a right, not riot, a right of, uh, of a, uh, not initiation, but a, a right in which you identify with being cleansed before God. Uh, they never thought it had a magical value that if you did it, somehow your sins went away and floated out, you know, out of the creek, you know, down the creek. Uh, by the way, do you know that, it's, who was that uh, General uh, Sam Houston in Texas? Uh, he's close, he actually has a church close to where we live, and the Baptist church that he attended, when he was baptized, when he came up, he made a comment regarding uh, how much sins that the fish had to, had to consume that he, <laughs> that he had put under the water. <laughs> and so he, uh, he had a, a humorous statement uh, at his time of baptism. Uh, he's poisoning the water with sins. But the, f the fact is that you have this idea of repent to change your way of thinking. You're going to alter and you're going to be baptized. You're going to be, and the word baptism, there is no way linguistically, there's no way what is called lexicography, dictionary meanings. There's no way to make baptizo or baptismos to be anything other than a dipping or immersion. And when I hear people say, were you, how were you baptized by, by immersion or by sprinkling? You can't be, how, how were you immersed? By sprinkling or, you know, that doesn't make any sense, right? And it's one of the, one of the problems that translators brought to us that's why we have to be very careful with these things. It's very common, and even today's translations that people do, to take and make words out of words. That is, they make the word Greek word, baptismos, and they create an English word called baptism. That's never right to do. You should never take any word in the biblical text and make an English word of it. It confuses the issue. You stick with what does the word mean in Greek, and then you work with it. So here, baptism is clear immersion. In the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins. And if anybody wants to read a paper on this, by the way, I've been working on the whole issue of Matthew 28, and I've written a couple of papers and given them on the question of why do we have Jesus, the name of Jesus throughout the, gospel, uh, throughout the book of Acts, and we have Jesus in Matthew 28 saying the Trinity. You ever seen that? Matthew 28 mentions the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but every reference in the New Testament in the book, in the book of Acts deals with baptism in the name of Jesus. There's a reason for that, but that's something beyond what I want to get into right now. It's too technical. But the, the point of it is you have a, a call for people to become regenerated. Now, there were added about 3,000 souls, so they had 3,000 people. That is a lot of people. And back to my story then, the Jews didn't have these long, prolonged kinds of things. They entered the baptismal waters, they were baptized, they came right back out. You could run them in like a, what would you call that when you run through a, a, like a, an assembly line? If you got 12 apostles and 3,000 people, you can, walk, you can make it happen in a few hours without any problems if you got the water in the place. <laughs> so see, the, the thing that got in the way of scholars saying this could not have happened because we know this I'm always saying, and I think you may have heard me on the tour, I make a point of saying that in so many issues, uh, scholars, what they do is uh, they have the, the, the archaeology catching up with the Bible. The, the information was there already. The archaeology demonstrates it so. It's just that they had, joined, they had, had a... a uh, a particular perspective that they had held on to without the evidence. And so what we look when we look at archaeology and we find this stuff, we say there is no issue here to argue. You understand? The evidence is plain. We base our, our beliefs on evidence. 
And so in this situation, uh, we have it. Now, I think there are three ways to look at this concept of for the forgiveness of sins. One, it says, in order to receive forgiveness of sins, which is not one that I would hold. I don't think you get baptized in order to receive forgiveness. Okay? The second option is because of the reception of forgiveness. Some people say, well, you're baptized because of the forgiveness of sins. But it's also requiring repentance. Will you be repentant? Do you repent because of forgiveness of sins? You don't have forgiveness of sins until you have repentance. So how could you make that part of the, of the, of the question? I think it's the third one. We are baptized and repent. We do this in view of the concept of forgiveness. That is, we identify with the fact that God saves based on our acknowledgement of our different way of thinking and our baptism. And it doesn't mean that, that the, the forgiveness itself saves anybody. And I don't, I don't think that's uh, uh, the, 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 the idea of baptism for forgiveness saves anyone. Okay. Now, here are the mikvaot, and there are two I show you here. Mikvah is singular, mikvaot is plural in Hebrew. And if you'll notice, they don't all look exactly the same, but they found a little over 30 of these at the southern wall. Now, many of you have been to Israel and have gone down the steps from the back of the southern wall, down the steps. They have uncovered over 30 of these mikvaot. There were plenty of these things for the apostles to use. And again, if they had an assembly service going, you know, it would not have been any trouble at all to baptize 3,000 people. You understand me? So again, I think the Scripture is accurate once we found the evidence. So, see, I have a view of Scripture. I don't think everything I will always understand in Scripture, and I don't think I can prove everything. But I do believe we have the Scripture from God, and that's enough for me. In other words, I believe Scripture is correct even if I haven't got all the evidence yet because I think I know who wrote it. <laughs> and I don't think he makes mistakes. But I think it's always good to try to find evidence. I think it helps us to understand more. But it doesn't require me to have all that evidence to believe. Matter of fact, if I had all the evidence without any question, I, I would just simply, uh, you know, I would have an absolute sense of knowledge. You know, I, it wouldn't be even holding on to the fact of what I believe in sometimes in spite of not understanding, which is the way I think we are in Christianity. Anyway, moving along. <clears throat> now, uh, I want to talk about the Jews from every nation. And here are the ones that the book of Acts talks about. And some of these I really have no great knowledge of because I haven't studied them. I have some, many I have. So I want to cover some things tonight, and Thursday night I'm going to deal with some more and talk about this. So let's look at this. This is the land of the diaspora, the dispersion of the Jews. And you can see here, if you look, that the Jews cover not only moving toward the west into Asia, but they also go down south and also east. So the Jews were dispersed throughout all of these various lands. And of course you have the uh, Aliyah, which is, means the coming back from the dispersion back into the land. Many Jews are doing that more and more, uh, although I'm not sure what's going on right now with, with uh, well, you know, the, the uh, Iranians have done well with that $6 billion that was given to them, and so giving again out to all the terrorists. Now the Jews are having trouble. I talked with one of my friends uh, online uh, who uh, is a soldier uh, over there, and also a professor of physics. You know him, right? And so, um, and he was uh, saying, well, be sure and pray for us, and so forth. So, uh, they've got some struggles to deal with now. He said, we, he said we're having all night duties. <laughs> so, they're watching out for stuff. So, you may want to keep that in mind. But what you have then is this dispersion throughout the world. And let's face it, not everybody had the inclination when they were a thousand miles away or 1500 miles away from Israel to say, you know, honey, let's, let's pack up and go back to Jerusalem because they got established where they were and that became home. And so they would come back to the feast, but they had family and friends and others and other places. And you know, that experience, even within our country that way, it's sometimes difficult to pick up and move, but they're in the dispersion. 
But when Aliyah comes around, when this idea of come back to the land, gradually the Jews are beginning to recover and come back to the land. And I think that will continue to happen. Uh, but here's the locations, and you can see the places. You have Egypt, that's in uh, obviously northern Africa, but overall through the left all the way to Libya. Uh, down into Arabia, uh, Judea is obviously the point center, you know, of everything, uh, which is the place of uh, Jesus and Jerusalem and everything else. Crete, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, these are all the countries that are being talked about in the book of Acts. People came back to Jerusalem for this week of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the feast. So now I'm going to say a few things about two or three places and I, I don't want to keep you too long tonight. Uh, we'll be out by 930. And uh, my wife says 10 minutes. No, it's 11. I've got 11 minutes. Don't you dare cut me short. I need every second. <laughs> but the land of the Hittites, do you know who the Hittites were? There are 48 instances of the Hittites mentioned in the Bible. And until the very end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, many of the scholars who said the Bible is just simply a human book and it has a lot of errors in it, those scholars, they uh, said that there were no Hittites. They never lived. Why? Well, say, if they lived, we would know it. Really? Because the very end of the 19th century, they found thousands of tablets by the Hittites and a massive kingdom that they ruled over that was larger than that of Assyria, probably in Babylonia. It covered almost all of what we call Turkey and more. See that? The section over here, you look above the island there, the big island called Crete today, and go up and all that red, that's almost the entirety of, a, of a, what we call Turkey today or Asia Minor and even goes down further into the areas of what we think of as Syria and other places. So you, it's a massive empire. But here's what's so unique about the Hittites. Other than the fact they're mentioned so many times in the Bible. The Hittites were the only kingdom of the entire ancient world that had a constitutional form of government. They were like Great Britain. It's a constitutional monarchy. And that's fascinating because all these other places larger were dictatorships. Now, Israel had a covenant relationship with Yahweh, which was different. But all these other countries you think about in the ancient world were basically ruled by a king, a dictator. The Hittites had a king, but he was not an absolute king. He was under a constitution. That's a fascinating concept to go back to think of you know, 2,000 years before Christ, that you had a kingdom that way. And they ruled um, throughout the area, but they had a capital up toward the north, and I've been there. I'm going to show you pictures of me out in the snow in the middle of the winter, uh, roaming around. Uh, the area that you go to, the place is called Hattusha, and when you look at it, it's actually three layers, like a, a layer cake, you had the plain below where you had ruins, not, you know, they were destroyed. But you know, there were houses, there were temples, there were buildings and other such things. But then you can move to it and go up with a car, or like I did, I walked, uh, up around three levels till you get to the top where the palace was. And there's some fascinating stuff there. Had a good friend until he passed away just a few years ago by the name of Dr. Harry Hoffner. He was a graduate of Dallas Seminary with his THM, went on, became a professor at uh, University of Chicago, was a major Hittite scholar in the world. He wrote the dictionaries, he wrote the lexicons, I mean, he wrote the grammars. You know, he was an expert in, in uh, Hittiteology. And uh, I did not know what something was. I guess I could have brought it and showed it to you. But I, I was up at the top and I came across what looked like a cavern. And it was a weird cavern because it was shaped like, uh, like this, like an oval of a sort. And so it was like this, and you walk through it, walk through it all the way to the end. And it was like, or like a triangle, I should say. That's probably what I mean to say. Like a triangle. And you walk through it to the end. And I said, what was that thing? I never could figure it out. He said, oh, that's how they flanked people in warfare. They would have that covered over 
people would come up to take and go to the capital, which is over this way. And so the army would come up this way, not knowing that through this tunnel was coming an army to flank them at the back and to catch them from both ends. And I thought, wow, that makes sense. I had to ask a guy who's an expert. So I never had anybody answer that for me. And so it's a really interesting thing to study. Hattusha was one of the great sites to visit. It's up close to Ankara. They even have a museum called the Anatolian Museum where they have the Hittite remains if you want to go in there sometimes. But this is when you go into the uh, entrance to the city of Hattusha. Two lions on either side. And you say, why do they have two lions on either side? Very common in the ancient world to put out statues of these idols, of as it were, that would protect the city. So you put those two lines there, and they're going to run. Anybody who wants to come in the city, they're going to run them away. Right? <laughs> no, because they would still probably be in business still. <laughs> they eventually were conquered, and the lines fell down on the job. But nonetheless, this is the entrance. Then you have, this is snow, in case you haven't seen it recently. Uh, this is the area in which you had uh, buildings. This went up. These are the steps that went in and up and down. This is actually the second layer there. This is the final layer up to the capital area and walking it up it. And I walked up and down that more than one time and around the area, uh, looking around. But when I stood up there at the top of this, I thought, man, this is a gorgeous area. No wonder they moved here. This is really, it was cool, but just brisk and it was, it felt good. It was really great. And so uh, this is a part of the Hittite kingdom. And there's so much here that proves I was there. And when you go into that area there, you might not know it when you do it. But when you walk through that place that I'm up to now, and this is about a mile from the actual palace area, you have to walk over there. Uh, when you walk through that, you get into an a area that's a religious sort of like a temple area, and it's all hidden in the back. So this is what you have. On the right, if you notice, that's where you would walk into it. I made this so I could see the whole thing. Walk to the end and go back the other direction. And on the right, you have this. These are the gods that protect Hattusha. Now, as you can see, they didn't do a good job because <laughs> they were finally conquered here. But the Hittites were very important because they oftentimes had treaties with Egypt. And they also had treaties with Assyria and Babylonia and Persia and so forth. They were a major, major kingdom. And they are the ones that provided the covenant concept written down that we actually observe in the biblical text itself. You wouldn't know this up front unless you look at it. But you can actually look at, for example, Exodus. And you can look at Deuteronomy and you can see the works of Moses. And you can see he actually follows the pattern of the Hittite treaty forms. Now think about that. It says that Moses was skilled and learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Is that correct? You ever read that in the Bible? Well, yeah, Moses was taught the various knowledge about the ancient world. He knew how to write treaties. He knew how to do war. He, he was trained as a prince of Egypt. Right? Someone who could become the Pharaoh even, theoretically. And so he was knowledgeable about this. And what he did in the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy, I've got it somewhere, I think. I can let you see it if you want it all broken down. The, you follow the biblical text, and it actually follows the same, le same structure as you find in the Hittite treaties. Matter of fact, what you find is something very interesting. In the Hittite treaties, you would put... A, a, a short, you'd have a long statement of agreement between the king, the, va the suzerain he was called, and the vassal who would be the person who lost <laughs> and now is a servant to the king. So what you have, he would make an agreement with these individuals and he would take one agreement fully written and then a condensation of it, a short statement, and put that together and he would put it into the uh, temple of the god of the vassal and a one of the, of the treaty between them to the god of the suzerain. You got that? Two treaties and two short statements 
of the requirements of being a vassal to the suzerain. Now, I know you saw the Ten Commandments, and I liked, I liked what Charlton Heston did. He did a great job. And, but you, everybody thinks that when you read the two tam, tablets of the law is five laws of God on one tablet and five laws of God on another tablet. But when you understand that the Hittite treaty form, which is used by Moses, would have had a short form of the law and then a large form of the law, that that would be written on one tablet and then a second tablet to go to the, to the suzerain. And now God is both, he's the God of the covenant and the God uh, that they have to obey by the commandment. So they actually took two tablets of the law front and back and put it into only one location, the, the Ark of the Covenant. There was no temple other than the one that God had. You understand me? The temple with Jerusalem, with the Jews, is one that is a, uh, both has, the, the, there is no other God to put a, a tablets into. So they all put them both in the, probably in the Ten Commandments, put them in the uh, Ark of the Covenant. So it follows this legal form. Uh, one, just a couple other things and we'll quit. Uh, Roman provinces in Asia Minor, we'll go into those a little bit. This is later than the time of the Hittites. Now Asia Minor has been taken over by who? You had the Greeks, you had the Romans, and so forth. So the world has changed from the time that the Hittites were defeated. And here's what you end up seeing in Cappadocia. If you ever get a chance to do this, this is a cool place to go. Uh, these are actually formed, uh, probably a volcano eruption, but they form these uh, what, little rock houses. They sometimes call them gnome houses. Sometimes they call it by another name. I'm trying to think what the name is. But it's, it's one that's a, a fairy, fairy houses or something or another where you actually have churches that existed in them and even homes were in them. And people lived in these things that were just basically like drops, and, they're, and, they're, and they're, uh, uh, they are uh, empty inside. And they would actually do uh, all sorts of frescoes and so forth on the walls of religious art all over the place. It's really fascinating to see. There you see people f do balloon rides over this if you want to. This goes about 100 miles of all these kind of buildings. There's some more balloons. You had to get up about 5 o'clock in the morning to get on the balloon. I didn't do it. Uh, but you had houses and churches in these gnome kind of buildings. And I'll run you through a few of these because we're running out of time. It exists in the midst of more modern buildings in the area, but just gives you an idea what these things look like. There you have a little garden. There's people looking around, and you can go into these places and live. They also have a lot of these that have this little thing on top. Now here's some of the artwork that was done inside. Isn't this amazing artwork? These are in all sorts of buildings that were used for churches in the Cappadocian area. By the way, the Cappadocian area is important for Christian history because in the 4th century when Arianism, the heresy that was condemned at Nicaea, finally began to blossom up and go back, it's the three fathers of the Cappadocian area who actually fought Arianism and finally got the, and this is important, pay attention somebody on the front row, um, it was very important to the fact in 381 they moved from Nicaea with its initial statement on Jesus being, you know, uh, begotten of the Father and so forth, uh, and one God, and moved from there in 325 to 381 in what we call Istanbul, which was called Constantinople in those days, that it would restore the doctrine of the Trinity as it was understood at Nicaea. And the council met at the Church of Arena. And uh, <laughs> that's Irina's name, and it's, it's from the Greek to mean peace. So it was actually in the church of St. Irina in uh, Constantinople in 381. So we actually visited that deliberately because she liked a church named after her. So um, anyway, they have these beautiful, beautiful places. And it shows you, by the way, as certain people took over in, in Asia Minor, guess what? When they found religious art, oftentimes they defaced it. You'll never guess the group. Fairly large, moved into Turkey. Oh, that's all I'll say. Uh, but you find a lot of defacing of things that relate to uh, Christian art. There I am with some people I met from different countries. 
Uh, here I am in front of the places. I want to uh, keep that going. There I am again. By the way, one thing you'll find in Cappadocia, besides these unbelievable gnome villages, is they had a lot. They had uh, two when I was there. They have now found another one. They have found now three underground cities that people lived in who fled persecution, first of all, from the Romans, and you know, before Christianity became official. First of all, the Romans, and then from the Muslims when they came into the 700s. And you actually go down into the earth. These, it's stone. They have massive round stones that have a hole in them, and they're up against the wall for where people lived. And in case a person comes, you could actually jab spears and stuff through it. Uh, they think that's what it was for. And so you have people living in the underground. I don't have any idea who that is, but the point is you can walk in like this. There I am. And this is a living room underground and a person's house underground. And they have hundreds of these places underground. Now they've found three big ones. Here's another place, probably a, a rec room. I don't know. And, uh, and then another, oh, that's not it. I thought I had another one. This is Antioch. I'm not going to cover that right now. But anyway, that gives you an introduction to the issue of Acts 2, the fact of the, uh, all the uh, uh, nations that were uh, dealt with in Acts 2 and what happened. Sort of gives you some exposition of that, but also introduces you to places that relate to it. All these countries we're not going to cover, but Thursday we're going to talk about some of the other ones and some of the importances of them in reference to the Scripture. So uh, I think that's what I have to say tonight. You may just lead, uh, end in prayer. Okay. Oh Lord, we just give you thanks for all your love and all your guidance of our lives and the way you take care of us, the way you brought us to yourself. We didn't do it of ourselves, Lord. Uh, actually, you brought us, and, and so we follow you, and we thank you for that. And Lord, we just pray that your word would be glorified through all of our lives and what we do and what we say, and help us to be teachers of the word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.